and that um, your uh, your certificate um, will be available for this session as soon as you complete a very short two question evaluation of which I'll keep putting the link up into the chat so that you can find it. So you just have to click on there, answer two questions and zoom, you get um, you get your certificate for um, for your professional learning hours. So I'm going to hand straight over to tonight's two presenters, Ellie Lamb and Darcy Foley for gender and inclusion in jazz education. Welcome. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the land on which we're presenting from tonight. Um, I'm presenting from uh, the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, and I repay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, we acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, and if anyone would like to chime into the chat with uh, where they may be attending from and pay respects to the traditional owners of those lands, please do feel free to pop those in the chat. Fantastic. All right. Well, firstly, thank you so much to everyone who is here today. We're very happy to see many of you digitally. Um, so I'm Darcy Foley. I'm a trombonist, vocalist and music educator from Melbourne. Um, my family are all in education and my two older sisters both studied jazz at university. I'm trumpet and trombone as well. So um, gender and jazz have played a big role in my life. Um, and I'm Ellie, I'm also a trombonist, a vocalist, um, a trombone teacher and a band director, um, a music educator. Um, so I also have uh, some uh, skin in the game when it comes to uh, gender and inclusion uh, in jazz education, um, especially as a, as a non-binary person uh, moving through this space. Um, and I also have the great fortune to have been selected this year um, as the Take Note leader for the Melbourne International Jazz Festival, uh, which is a role specifically designed um, to support and encourage and give platforms to uh, female and gender diverse jazz artists and jazz leaders. Um, so I'm speaking from sort of from that place today as well, um, which is really exciting. Awesome. Um, so last year, as part of my Masters of Educational Leadership, I did a bit of a meta analysis on gender and music education and specifically in jazz. So um, really today we're trying to get across these key themes of the research and hopefully give you some practical strategies uh, to enact in your schools. Um, obviously, as we're talking today, your context will determine which of these strategies are possible for you and your school and your students. So, let's go. Hey, all right. So, um, <laughs> gender and inclusion in jazz education. Uh, obviously, the issues surrounding gender imbalance in jazz music are highly complex. There are many factors and unfortunately, no simple solution. Um, but we know it's something that needs to be addressed at every level. So right from primary school age students through to performing musicians. Why it matters. Now, um, you know, why does it matter if female and gender diverse students are underrepresented in your jazz ensembles? Um, the fact that you're in this PL now probably means we don't need to tell you this, uh, but increasing their representation will allow these students the benefits of engaging in jazz, which is such a wonderful art form. Interestingly, um, creating diverse groups has also been shown to uh, increase group cohesion and performance as seen in Reverge and Van Dyck's uh, 2010 paper on the benefits of diversity. So it is also the male students in your ensembles who statistically will currently be the majority. Um, they're also going to benefit from being in a more gender diverse environment. So it's really a win-win creating these places. So firstly, uh, have a think about the jazz ensembles in your school and their gender ratios. If you've managed to create an environment that has resulted in a fairly gender balanced ensemble for those in co-educational schools, we really look forward to hearing about what has worked for you because that is fantastic. Um, unfortunately, we do know that this isn't the norm. Um, which begs the question, what can be done to improve this balance? 
Today, we're going to touch on three key themes of the research, which is instrument selection, improvisation, and creating inclusive environments. Uh, we'll then touch on the benefits and potential limitations of modelling, and we would love to finish with a discussion and hear your thoughts on these issues, thoughts, suggestions, questions. So uh, if you do have any questions or suggestions, please feel free to note them down for the discussion later on, or you can write them in the chat as we go along too. Again, this is a really nuanced issue and obviously today we can't cover all facets of gender and its implications in jazz education and performance, um, but we hope to give you a greater overall understanding of the issue and get some conversations started. So just a quick refresher on these things for anyone who needs it. Um, so sex and gender, two distinct concepts here. So a person's sex is based on, upon their sex characteristics, um, such as chromosomes, hormones, and um, might be identified as male, female, or intersex with plenty of other variations. Now, gender, which we're talking about today, is a social and cultural concept or construct. So signifies these differences in identity, expression, and experience, um, often as a woman, man, or non-binary person, and often perceived as masculinity or femininity, which we see a lot in the research. Uh, just to clarify, so non-binary is an umbrella term describing gender identities that are not exclusively male or female. Um, for those in co-ed schools, it's going to be obvious that you're teaching across the sex and gender spectrum. Uh, it's important to note, though, that for those in single sex schools, though it's single sex, it's very unlikely that you'll be teaching students all with the same gender identity. There will be variation. So we hope you can take from this as well. So just a little uh, caveat on the, on the research. Um, much of the literature and conversation around gender in music does refer to male, female, men, women, or boys and girls, uh, which we want to acknowledge is inherently problematic because it just doesn't give insights into our gender diverse people. So we do hope to see more research in the future that explicitly looks at the experience of gender diverse students and musicians, and just want to acknowledge that as we talk through that research today. All right. Here's a little diagram I drew, a fairly basic flowchart of how gender imbalance plays out in jazz music. As you can see, this gender imbalance begins at the point when students select their instruments. This then determines their ability to participate in the school's jazz ensembles or big bands. And then their experience in this setting influences whether they choose to study in tertiary level. And if you can see that tiny little box down the bottom, that is a visual representation of the non-male instrumentalists who pursue performance after completing their university studies. I am being facetious. Uh, unfortunately, I did not have statistically verified numbers with which to draw these boxes, uh, but it is a genuine issue and it does stem from the factors outlined above it. The music industry is waking up to the lack of female and gender diverse representation with vested parties having lots of conversations and forums about how to support and showcase these performers at the top end. So, for example, diversity in festival lineups and on uh, radio airtime, those sorts of things. These are definitely essential conversations to be having. Um, but in today's session, we hope to explain to you why the early stages of musical development can really be targeted to see meaningful change throughout each phase of engagement with music. Um, and as teachers, I argue that we have the greatest ability to affect meaningful change in the professional arena in this way. Okay, here we go. Instrument selection. This is a major theme of the literature and one which I'm sure many of you will be aware of. So um, though the gender stereotyping of instruments had been acknowledged and questioned prior, uh, Harold Velez and Susan Porter were the first to really comprehensively study this phenomenon in 1978 and have been cited by everyone since really. 
Uh, so this study found that sex stereotyping of instruments was widespread and limited musical opportunities. Their research suggested that drums, trombone and trumpet were considered to be masculine instruments, while flute, clarinet and violin were deemed feminine on the right hand side there. Interestingly, saxophone and cello were found to be neutral in their gender associations. Their study spanned kindergarten age students to adults and the sex stereotyping was evident from the kindergarten age students upwards, which is quite significant. Um, they also though found there was an intensification of the stereotyping around middle school age, which is age 11 to 13. So that also aligns with research that suggests that this is the age when children are most influenced by their environments, um, such as Wigfield, Lutz and Wagner's 2010 study. So when we think about when the majority of students in Australian schools pick up an instrument, this is really important because in independent schools, this may often be in a compulsory band program, uh, usually introduced at year five or year seven. And for students in government schools, the key recruitment time is that beginning of secondary school in year seven. How old do we know these students are? 10, 11, 12, 13. So we're smack bang in that prime time for intensification of this stereotyping, which many of you may have noticed across your programs. So for the optimists among us, the good news is that this study was over 40 years ago, right? It must have changed. Alas, here is a small selection of the studies that have shown these stereotypes to be pervasive and enduring. Um, through the updated research, we also add a few extra instruments to the list in tuba, bass and guitar as stereotypically masculine instruments. And we can add voice, oboe and harp to the stereotypically feminine. A couple of studies I'm just going to point out there. So um, an interesting one is Howard Bellis in 2000 eight there. Um, so he revisited his original study to see if gender associations had changed over the 30 years. Um, and there was some evidence to suggest that girls had become more open to playing non-stereotypical instruments. However, the patterns of gender and instrument choice had remained consistent over this wide time frame. In terms of the global perspective, uh, Sheldon and Price in 2005 found that these stereotypes were fairly consistent in wind and percussion ensembles across 25 countries. Um, and the US and Australia ranked similarly for gendered instrument associations. That's quite important because a lot of the research does come from the US, but with this knowledge, it does give us greater statistical confidence when applying this research to the Australian context. Uh, one to note is that Sinsabar in 2005 uh, did note a diversion in these common patterns in some Asian cultures, uh, with boys often encouraged to play violin and flute. If you're in this session, I imagine it is apparent to you, but almost all the instruments within a typical big band lineup are on that left-hand side skewed at the masculine end. Thus, it's not surprising that the research shows that instrument choice is a significant factor in participation in high school jazz ensembles, and thus further studies and involvement down the track. Um, McKeech in 2004 that I've highlighted there is a great, great read and great reference for this. Um, and there's a few others there listed as well. Just a quick note, I've got the references at the end of the slide, if you're keen to do some more reading. Okay, so we know what's going on. We can see what's happening with instrument selection, why it's skewed one way. Let's talk through a few strategies. So from the research, we know that factors that may influence students in their selection include the views of their parents, and their peers, the sound, size and role of the instruments, um, the input of their music teacher and their experiences of performances on these instruments. 
it is our job as educators to do all that we can to mitigate the effects of gender stereotyping in this instrument selection process. And I'm sure many of us are keen to do that. Uh, the strategies I'm going to suggest here are informed partly by the meta-analysis of the research that I undertook and also some with qualitative data based on interviews with peers and colleagues. Firstly, we must challenge our own beliefs to see if we might be perpetuating unconscious bias. And this may present as telling a student that they look like a trumpet player or associating the pitch of a student's voice with their potential on a low or high instrument. Or at the extreme end, maybe thinking a female student may not be capable of playing high notes on a brass instrument due to their anatomically smaller lungs. Um, these might sound silly to some people, uh, but they're all direct quotes from music educators in recent years. Um, maybe you've thought these things previously, or maybe you've heard a colleague say them. Um, we know that this does not come from a place of knowingly perpetuating these stereotypes. Um, however, these kind of comments are impactful and we need to question them. Secondly, let, we need to consider how the instruments are presented to the students. So if you have the option in instrument demonstrations, try to use teachers who do not fit the stereotype on the instrument. Um, so many larger music programs are fortunate to have multiple woodwind teachers who might double on a few instruments. Um, consider having a male teacher demonstrate the flute and a female teacher the saxophone. Another important thing is to examine your recruitment materials, uh, especially in a lot of government schools. So this might include pamphlets, websites, um, recruitment nights and any other information that's shared with students and parents and really look for whether they are affirming or challenging these stereotypes. In classroom music, so particularly at the younger year levels, consider the musicians that are visible to your students. Um, I've begun teaching classroom music this year and Though obviously I have a significant interest in the issues we're discussing today, it wasn't until partway through term two that I realized the clips I'd been showing to my students at the beginning of every class had been almost entirely comprising of male musicians. Um, it does take more time to find clips with non-male musicians, um, but it is important. So you can share the load by creating uh, shared playlists on YouTube or setting up a Google Doc with other educators who are also interested in doing this. Okay, next, I want to address compulsory programs, which many of you may work in. So if you are part of a compulsory program at a co-educational school, you are in the prime seat to make a quick and substantial difference to the baseline factor in why we see less female and gender diverse students in jazz. Um, I do appreciate the job of instrument allocation is large and often thankless. I mean, why does everyone want to play the saxophone? I still don't get it. Um, but if you're not considering gender in your allocations, I really encourage you to do so. Some practical strategies for this could include getting students to select one preference from each instrument family, because we do know that there is separation within the families. Um, and another strategy might be to aim to allocate students in line with the gender ratios at the school. We're already manipulating student preferences to ensure adequate instrumentation or just physical instruments um, and balanced ensembles. So why not manipulate this same, you know, these same forms to aim for greater gender balance? It is common practice to consider gender balance in most academic classes in a co-educational school. Um, and I argue that we should be doing the same, even when we're looking at small instrumental groups. 
Uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, if you're pursuing this practice, when it comes to non-binary or gender non-conforming students, use your knowledge of the young person and allocate them where you think they'll have the best chance of success. Uh, the system doesn't need to be perfect. And when we consider the variety of gender identities alongside other factors like timbre preference, aptitude on the instrument, there won't be a simple solution that will work in every context. Um, but again, it's just about doing your best. Obviously, we want to get to the point where the need to consider gender balance isn't necessary at this level. Um, but while this is a very present issue with significant consequences for the engagement with jazz and contemporary music, we do need to keep trying to find solutions. Okay, strategy number four. We have all seen that group of kids sitting up the back whispering, and next thing you know, you have 11 budding euphonium players in your class of 15. So <laughs> obviously peer influence has been shown to be a significant factor. So it's worth considering this and trying to mitigate it in your context. Um, ideas for this could include spacing the students out in the room when they're completing their forms, uh, a digital form completed at home, uh, or just doing their preferences as they go around trying instruments before they can debate with their friends as to whether the trumpet or trombone is the coolest. So um, I just want to note here, if your school has a history of using the hands up style instrument selection process in front of the class or group, trying out an alternative to that might be a really simple way of reducing that peer influence and its potential gender stereotyping impact. Okay, next I'd like to address physical factors and how slight modifications can help a student of any size to play an instrument. As a low brass teacher, I see this a lot with tubers and trombones, uh, with parents, students, and some colleagues assuming kids will be too small to transport the instrument, or in the case of trombone, to reach the further positions. Now, I am a professional trombonist, and much to the amusement of my longer limbed brass playing siblings, I cannot actually reach seventh position. Can't believe I'm saying this in public, but it's true. I have two options to get around this. Either I can screen all of my potential gigs by analyzing the likelihood of tunes being in E major, or alternatively, I can use the unconventional technique of rolling my shoulder forwards and adjusting my grip on the slide. Fortunately for fellow short arm beginner trombonists, B naturals just don't come up that often. <laughs> so I share this as a reminder that our perception of these limitations can often be overcome with a little bit of creative thinking. And if you need me to show that specific technique, you can ask me later. All right, so another strategy for students who may be smaller is to get instrument cases with wheels. Um, this is especially helpful, I know, for euphoniums, tubers, and double basses, and you can get straps for trombone cases. And another great solution I've seen is for the school to have some fold up trolleys on hand, uh, which you just get from Bunnings, and you can provide these to the students who need them to transport their instrument comfortably. All right, I'm going to pass over to Ellie now. Thanks, Darcy. Um, so, um, as Darcy's outlined really, really well, instrument selection is a huge, huge factor in who we see progressing through our programs on different instruments and in different ensembles. Um, so another, another huge factor within our jazz education programs is um, educating students about improvising. Um, I suspect, again, you're all here, so you all have an interest in jazz programs. Um, and most of you will probably be aware that improvising is generally considered to be a substantial part of the jazz world, jazz idiom. Um, uh, so for many school age musicians, their first introduction to jazz music is in a big band, right? Most schools that have jazz programs, including most of ours here in Shaw, have at least one, if not more stage bands in which students begin to learn those fundamental uh, components um, of jazz music. Um, and these types of ensembles are fantastic and they benefit school environments largely because of their science. You can have 
20 students in a big band. Um, so it can be more inclusive of more students, but they do tend to offer limited opportunities for improvisation. And when there are solos in the music, uh, those solos are often used to exclusively feature a small number of particular students uh, and are often doled out as rewards for those who are already playing well or to feature those students. Um, which means that despite the fact that improvisation is generally considered to be a massive part of jazz for music and music we would call jazz or other contemporary musics, um, it's often the case that many students um, have very limited chances to learn and develop these skills. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the impact that can have um, within our programs, within, um, uh, within different groups of students and, and how we might combat those. Uh, so take a moment um, while we're sitting here to consider how and when you might be introducing the idea of improvisation to your students in your jazz program. Are the solos in the pieces being distributed by default to your strongest players? Uh, or the students who have it written in on their part, uh, or maybe those who ask for it? Are you actively or passively discouraging some students from playing solos just because they maybe haven't expressed interest or maybe really new to it or don't feel confident yet? Uh, are you leaving it to the students' individual teachers to teach them how to improvise and bring that to your ensemble? Or are you as a, a band leader taking an active role in introducing the students to some of those skills and ideas? Um, Something that can be very easily overlooked in any school jazz program is introducing improvising skills early and in a manner that clearly sets it out as a part of a musician's toolkit, uh, just like being able to sight read, develop technical mastery, learn about section playing, all those other things that we all do all the time when we run jazz ensembles. Um, so too easily we can either consciously or unconsciously reinforce the idea that the ability to improvise is maybe just some sort of innate musical talent rather than something that can be taught or learned, or we reinforce ideas that it's hard, that it's scary, uh, that it's not for everyone. Um, and these ideas can be accidentally passed on from, from us as band leaders, from our individual tutors, uh, or from our peers, you know, for the students' peers. Um, and I believe it's essential to any jazz program within a school to stamp out these ideas really early and equip all students equally with the fundamental skills needed to improvise solos um, and really demystify that in such a way that everyone can understand the basics, even if they're not all perhaps going to then pursue um, doing lots and lots of solos, if it's introduced as a skill that is part of being in that type of music, it demystifies it, it de-escalates some of those nerves, and it gives everyone the opportunity to ask questions they need to ask uh, and have doors opened that they might then pursue. Not all students are going to say, I really want to know how to solo. It might take a teacher opening that door to inspire them to then pursue that. So that's our job as educators, is to open those doors. Um, to all students to be able to walk through and not leave it up to them to stumble across it either in their private lessons or their listening. Uh, so um, another big feature of um, our jazz education program is um, the idea of jazz competitions. Um, and I have frequently joked um, with Darcy and other friends that I, you know, I study jazz at university and have a degree in competitive bebop because that's sometimes how it feels. Um, it's all just about who can play the most notes the fastest and who's got the best big band. Um, so as anyone who is involved in a high school jazz program would know, competitions are a massive feature of jazz education throughout Australia. Uh, for many staff and students, yearly trips to Mount Gambia to compete in Generations in Jazz, uh, and as of this year, the All-State Jazz Champs are some of the biggest calendar events on our, uh, on our band uh, radars, on our jazz ensembles. Um, and some outcomes of this are immensely positive. Uh, they give students the impetus to work really hard and have each individual and the ensemble sound in their best. Uh, it's a great goal for performance. Um, can bring out the best in some students and it's a great opportunity to go and hear other bands um, but a focus on competition outcomes if and when it's at the expense of other educational outcomes can contribute to only particular students having opportunities to develop improvisational skills within programs uh, and it can pit students in the ensemble against each other as they vie for the opportunity to have a solo and therefore potentially be selected for a super band or similar ensemble again this can have some positive outcomes for some students as a motivation to work hard and improve, but it can be alienating and have significant negative outcomes for other students. Um, so within this competitive framework, there are significant social and psychological barriers that arise for female and gender diverse students when it comes to participating in these environments. Uh, studies by McKeegan 2004 and Hendricks et al. in 2016 suggest that the competitive nature of high school jazz can be a substantial deterrent to these female and gender diverse students. Uh, and in a 2006 study where Flowers examined the gender difference in attitudes regarding improvisation, finding that female students, again, broadly female students, were less confident, more anxious, and had less self-efficacy towards learning jazz improvisation. Uh, 
This is consistent with studies that suggest that music educators perceived boys to have more confidence in improvisation and to be inherently more creative than compared with girls. And that study is from Gillespie and Kowalski in 2013 and Green in 97. Now, none of this means that our female and gender diverse students are any less capable of being great improvisers, nor does it mean that they're inherently less interested in being great improvisers. It just tells us that the environments in which they're expected to learn these skills are alienating. Uh, and this is an, an issue that can be addressed if we're mindful of it in the way we educate our students. Um, and this comes back to all of the earlier things that Darcy talked about, all of the ways in which students are directed because of social stereotyping to certain instruments in the first place, ideas that they develop through exposure. All of these things that vie into instrument selection also play into feeling uh, comfortable and um, even allowed to take up space as an improviser. Um, so these issues arise through the, because of all the same reasons and um, uh, are continuations of these same problems. It's not that um, female and gender diverse students generally have are anxious about those things in, um, in isolation. Those are learned behaviours. We learn through our upbringing, through our socialising, to fear improvisation because of the way it's introduced to us and because of the environments in which we perceive that. And if it can be learned, it can be unlearned. We're not taught in the first place. That's really important to know. Um, now, of course, I do want to say as well at this point, of course, we also all want to and should celebrate the students in our programs who are performing at a high level. And I'm not saying that Gambia can't be an opportunity to feature those students who are doing that. Of course, it should be. Um, but we have to have room in our programs for everyone to have a chance to get to that high level in the first place. And if we make room in those programs for improvisation to be explored as a set of skills that everyone can develop and learn and learn together collaboratively, we'll see better outcomes for a larger number of students because more students will have those doors opened in the first place and be able to ask the important questions and pursue those important skills. So how can we do this? Uh, one, uh, to me, very obvious solution is to have all members of your jazz ensembles improvise early from the get go. Be mindful again of what I said earlier about introducing ideas of, well, the solo goes to the best person or to 10 or one or to trumpet two. Hey guys, we're in it, we're not guys. Hey, you know, folks, hey people. Um, we're all gonna learn some of these skills because improvising is a big bit of jazz music and we're all gonna learn how to do it and we're all gonna learn it together. And then later on, we'll worry about who takes the solo in the concert. Yeah. So though it may take time, teaching every member of the ensemble the basics of improvisation ensures it's a safe space for students to explore this. Um, and the earlier you do it in the student's journey into jazz, the better. This is early intervention for developing some of those anxieties later. Uh, this strategy has been advocated by many people uh, who will be familiar to those who attended the Essentially Ellington teacher workshops in Melbourne with Vince Gardner. Uh, they recommended using the basic 12 bar blues and taking all students through chord tones. Um, you could also incorporate basic call and response activities, given a small set of notes to begin with. Uh, use your knowledge and strengths to devise a strategy for your ensemble that makes improvising fun, easy to understand, and achievable for all band members, all of them. Um, as part of my take note role with the Jazz Festival this year, I was briefly running some workshops in a number of schools, you know, pre-COVID uh, or when we've been out of lockdown. Um, and I put together one, one method for introducing uh, improvisation in a very uh, stepped way um, for the students um, who are participating in those programs. Um, and I have some thoughts and, and resources on, on how I put these things together um, that include these kinds of call and responses, playing through chord tones together as a group, um, and some other activities. If you want to discuss that more with me in more specific detail, I'm always very happy uh, to go through that. But um, in the interest of getting through everything today, I just wanted to flag that those are a few techniques I've used with great success. Um, uh, as we all know, um, the vast majority of high school level big band charts have solos written into lead alto, lead tenor, and first or second trumpet. So if you're following the charts that your band is playing, uh, you're doing all the students a disservice. Um, so the only way for students to gain confidence and to feel able to, to improvise is to do so regularly and do so in a safe space. So even if the chairs in your band represent maybe the strongest improvisers that you might want to feature in a concert or performance, opportunities within rehearsal and within concerts should also be shared around throughout the year to give every student the opportunity to try, to have a go and to develop these skills practically. Um, no one's going to suddenly become a great improviser just by sitting on third trombone and listening to everybody else improvise. And maybe that little third trombone kid is going, oh, I kind of like to have a go, but it's not in my part. And we'll just instantly shut off the fact that that's even a possibility. Yeah. Um, what we don't realise is how much um, 
a student that may not be champing at the bit, chomping at the bit, sorry, to champing, chomping, oh, I'm going to think about that later, um, but we might be really excited. Students that express that desire to solo, we kind of go, oh, they're really keen, but there might be 15 other kids in the band that are going, oh, I wouldn't mind having a go at that, but I don't really know what I'm doing. It's not my place. It's not my job. I'm a third trombone player. I'm the bass player, etc. So if it's opened up as something that's possible for everyone from the get-go, everyone knows that there are doors that they can walk through. Um, and I think it's well worth not playing written solos in charts. Just give everyone the opportunity to have a crack at making up their own solos. And maybe an activity is everyone go and, you know, notate a solo that they've written. There are um, many benefits to um, pre-preparing a solo, but make the students go through that process for themselves, learn those fundamentals, even if it's in a less time sensitive environment. Um, so there are ways around, you know, students may be wanting to take a solo, but not wanting to improvise on the spot. They can still develop these skills through writing a solo at home or during band time. So there are ways around that, um, that still give everyone the opportunity to take part. And also open up solo sections, rather than saying, oh, there's only one repeat in the chart, or there's no repeats in the chart. Open it up, give five kids a solo, great. Um, the more, the merrier. Um, something that also is worth being aware of um, is that not all the private teachers of your students might have the training expertise or interest to teach their students to improvise. Um, so if you as a band director as of a jazz ensemble, uh, you know that some students in your ensemble are having some opportunities and experiences to work with teachers who are going through this, and some might not. Maybe consider, A, making the ensemble space where they can learn those skills, uh, and be providing resources and opportunities to your staff to walk those students through those skills. Um, so if you know that, you know, um, the brass teacher maybe isn't an a trained improviser, but is, is interested and has students in the program, say, hey, this is the activity we're going through in, in band. It's getting all the students improvising. Can you run it with the students in your lesson this week, um, even as a warm up or something like that? So have dialogue with your instrumental teachers to make sure they're all part of that solution as well. Um, Amazing. Thoughts on helping students develop improv vocabulary and stylistic understanding during ensemble time. That is a challenge and ensemble time is limited. Um, so obviously we can't do everything as band directors and that is really challenging. Um, I would suggest having like one little exercise each week, even if it's as a warm up to a tune or to a rehearsal. Um, so maybe you know, week three, we're doing a blues. So uh, here's some blues leaks that we can all learn and play together for five minutes because we're playing this blues tune. You know, maybe we're playing a Latin tune. So in, you know, in week six, we're going to open up and we're going to do 10 minutes of maybe some like, have a listen to a, a Latin solo and then have build an exercise around some Latin phrasing that everyone does together. Building them in a small exercises within the scope rather than feeling like you need to spend the whole rehearsal perhaps doing that is one really effective way just to give little bits of vocab, little bits of thought and little bits of listening uh, each week that are maybe relevant to the charts you're doing as well. Um, one thought that I had there, but I will, I will dwell on that further um, as well. Um, fab, all right, I'm gonna press on to this next slide. Um, so while improvising uh, often involves featuring one single musician, at its core, it's a skill developed through listening and interacting. So consider uh, on the back of, of those kinds of activities, exploring improvisation in ensembles as a group activity, rather than simply singling each person out and making them all do solos on their own, which is also great. Um, but activities like a call and response with the whole band, playing through chord tones together, learning licks together, they can all be done in large or small groups within your ensemble uh, and giving all students opportunity to develop some language without necessarily being in the spotlight, which might be confronting for some students. Um, and of course, there will always be students in your program who are more interested or less interested in taking solos when it comes to performance. And that's fine and that's good. And we want to celebrate the students who are keen. And we don't want to alienate and put pressure on the students who aren't. So by doing exercises that are collaborative and work together, um, it's more about demonstrating how the skills are required than forcing every student to always take a solo, if that makes sense. Um, and one last thought on, on improvising within our ensembles is um, do take a moment to consider um, the gender split in your band when you do assign positions in a band. So if you run auditions for your band every year and you have two students that are, you know, that you sort of determine to be equally, um, equally great as a, as a lead, uh, in your section, do think about how it might affect other students and the representation to younger students within your school, to their peers, and to your community. Um, and genuinely consider giving that role to a female or gender diverse student um, 
where appropriate. Obviously, use your instincts. You know, you know your programs better than anyone else. But if you're in a situation where you're choosing between student A and student B, if one can provide great representation within your community, go for it. Um, again, we commonly uh, preference older students over younger in these situations. You say, oh, well, they're in year 12, and, you know, so we should give them that opportunity. Why not, you know, stretch that same logic to other aspects of, of our education kind of systems and spaces? Um, it's also uh, really important not just to get representation across the ensemble, but in those key roles as leaders and soloists. Um, question your own beliefs about personality as well and look at what you think might make a good leader. When you put together your band, it's very easy to go, that gregarious student is really like great as a lead alto player, but maybe there's a quiet, but very confident, quietly confident student that could equally well lead a section that maybe doesn't fit the initial bill of lead alto or lead trumpet in terms of the stereotyping of it of being a really bombastic, probably male student. But think about other, other ways in which they might bring themselves to that role that could be beneficial for your ensemble. Um, diversity is not just about you know, how we look and how we present, but it's the, the voices that we have, the thoughts that we have. And so by having more diverse leaders in your band, you're going to get more diverse thoughts and um, conversations happening and musical ideas happening. Um, just a side note as well, there might be scope within your ensemble to be really creative about um, setting that up as well. So the way we distribute, you know, first tenor, first alto, second trumpet, um, but being able to share the solos from there and say, well, let's give the third trumpet a solo, let's do the bass solo, let's split up the solos is one way. Um, there might other be, be other ways to say, well, you know, we've given this student uh, lead tenor, um, but, you know, or particularly in larger sections like trombones or trumpets, maybe they have part one, but you dub the third trombone kid that's really got a great sense of community as the section leader, you know, so you can celebrate people by giving them different roles within the ensemble as well. So just trying to create spaces where people are really recognised and a diverse section, a cross section of your ensemble is recognised. Uh, so rush through my final thoughts here and, and get back to our third topic, um, but um, take a moment just to consider as you as you go back in, if you're implementing some of these thoughts, consider the function of your jazz program within your music department and what outcomes you'd like that to bring for your students. What are we teaching them and why are we teaching them that? Um, so ultimately, my thought is that improvisation is about voice. Having the skills and confidence and the opportunity to improvise is about projecting yourself into music in a unique way. Every student should have the opportunity to have those experiences. And certainly not every student, as I said, will be interested in having a solo, say, at the concert or at Generations. But if improvising is presented in a way that it's seen as merely another skill set, along with sight reading, along with section playing, along with all those other fundamentals you cover in a jazz ensemble, rather than a reward or an opportunity to feature, students who may not initially feel comfortable in that space will have a chance to find their voice in a really safe way. Um, at its core, a school music program is about education. So the learning outcomes should be a key factor at all times, as well as the competition, competition results. Um, so ultimately your ensemble and your program and your students, as well as the broader music scene, will benefit from a greater number of voices being heard and developed, particularly voices that currently are underrepresented at every level of musical performance from our most junior to our most professional musicians. Thank you, Ellie. All right. Okay, so our third major theme for today is creating inclusive environments. We must remember that students playing gender non-stereotypical instruments are more likely to receive antagonistic or exclusionary comments regarding their choice. So it is the responsibility of music staff to keep an eye out for this and to actively counter this gender stereotyping. On the next note, language matters. If you hear your students referring to their sections or their ensemble or their bandmates as the lads or the fellas or the boys, um, I recommend you just ask them to stick around after rehearsal and you try chatting to them about why this language may be exclusionary. I think the boys is really having its time again with the youth, so that's definitely one to look out for. Um, so conversations after the fact may be less, a less confronting way to get your message across. Um, though again, of course, this depends on the context and what you're hearing as to how you address it. Um, so the next point is to make sure that all staff are aware of the students that are gender diverse, uh, as this will help them to avoid unintentionally misgendering the student. 
Um, this is especially important when we consider that instrumental staff, um, particularly those who are part-time or casual, may not be privy to this knowledge in the same way as classroom music or full-time staff. Next up is gender neutral band uniforms. It is a, quite a simple way to make people comfortable in how they present. Uh, so with my ensembles, rather than saying, boys wear this, girls wear this, you just list the items of clothing that you want them to wear and let them choose. Next up, so music camps and tours. So when planning camps or tours, really consider the experience of the students who are in a gender minority. Um, seemingly innocuous decisions such as allowing boys to visit other boys' rooms and girls to visit other girls' rooms can create a sense of exclusion from these important social spaces. Um, the simple solution there is just to encourage everyone to hang out together in a common space. And, you know, bands who play ping pong together swing together because it rhymes. Um, but in all seriousness, every gender-based decision that you make as an educator does contribute to the experience of your students and should be considered carefully. Um, and creating inclusive in spaces, creating inclusive ex spaces is <laughs> equally important in single sex schools. So if you're th sitting there thinking, oh, I don't work at a college school, this isn't so relevant. Um, there are still very important ways in which this, um, this plays in if you teach in an all boys or an all girls school. Um, uh, firstly, there is a good chance that even in those environments, you will have gender diverse students, whether you know it or not, whether the students know it or not, um, but students will be adversely affected by many of these issues, including single gendered language, like the boys, like the fellas. Um, there will also, in a lot of these situations, um, even in a single sex school, um, the opportunity to say, you can wear a suit or a gown or, you know, or a skirt or, you know, like listing options for formal wear can be incredibly empowering and incredibly inclusive for all students, regardless of, um, of who they are. They'll feel more empowered in those spaces. And that is leading more towards a professional model of we dress in black for orchestra or whatever it is. But within that, there is opportunity and scope for expression within that. Um, and also, it must be the hope of all music staff that students will go on either while they're at school or after leaving school to play their instruments elsewhere with other people. Um, so even if maybe they've gone to school at an all boys or an all girls school, um, degendering instruments and musical expectations of others in the classroom will help them to play with a more diverse range of people in other areas of their life, which surely we all hope our students go on to do. All right, so wanted to touch again on modeling, which has been a little bit interspersed in some of the other slides, but um, some people really view this as the nail in the coffin of gender inequity. Um, and please let me start by saying it is great and you should definitely encourage it. Um, you can start by showing your students female and gender diverse musicians, uh, included a few legends. That list is very brief, by the way. If you want more, just let me know. Um, and the second thing is consider the gender of your band directors, uh, where skill sets align, try to include female and gender diverse staff as leaders of your jazz bands or tutors within these groups. And another strategy is to seek out music written or arranged by female and gender diverse composers and arrangers. Again, it's about showing your students that this is a possibility for them. One note on the limitations of modeling, specifically regarding all female bands. Now, I have played in some killer all female bands, um, both intentional and unintentional, and certainly don't want to dismiss their benefits. However, we do kind of have to note that there have been a large number of all female, again, female, in the commas, big bands. Um, they've been around since the 30s and 40s. They were a huge deal, uh, including like, the International Sweethearts of Rhythm, the Melodies, and a bunch of others. Now, considering how long ago that was, we can see that this hasn't necessarily resulted in more female and gender diverse representation in our big bands. So um, personally, we would advocate for better gender integration 
through positive experiences in mixed gender ensembles. As we mentioned before, we are not existing in a vacuum here. We are a part of a much larger society that is also grappling with these issues and trying to figure out how to address the complexity. So why I say that, I undertook a deep dive into the mind of a student who has just begun playing jazz and thought, where might they get their information from? And a Google search was undertaken. So I just Googled greatest jazz musicians and we have some amazing musicians in here. We've got Duke and Louis and Herbie and Ella. What I did next was made a very slight modification to that search. Bum, ba, da, da. So instead I typed in greatest female jazz musicians. We now have Ella, Billy, Nina, all incredible musicians in their own right. Uh, but the common thread is that they're most known as vocalists. And this is so apparent that Google chooses to automatically change our search thread to singers, female jazz. Just to point that out, music artist jazz, singers, female jazz. This is just a short and basic example of the messaging that our female and gender diverse students receive day in and day out. And it just shows us why we have to work so damn hard to break down these gender stereotypes in jazz music. So a little conclusion, where to from here, a few key points before, and then we'll move into our discussion. So firstly, assess your ensembles for gender balance. That's a really important step. Then we wanna start conversations with your colleagues and your schools about what is working, what might not be working, and what strategies you might be able to implement to continue on this journey. Share your successes, please. We'd love to hear what you've done in your schools to address these issues successfully. Um, next, remember that this is a very complex issue and there is no quick fix, but that every action towards improved gender representation is a positive one. So, Thank you again for listening. We know that was a huge chunk of information thrown at you, uh, but I'm just gonna quickly show you through these references in case on the recording you wanna pause and check out these ones. We will start the discussion. Again, for a copy of the slides, strategies or feedback, uh, you can email myself at music at gmail.com or ellie at elliewarmusic at gmail.com. I'll just quickly give you two seconds on each of these reference slides so that you can pause it later on if you're very keen. All right, and let's go back. Questions, thoughts, comments. Um, maybe Ellie, because I'm screen sharing, it's just a little harder for me to see in the chat, but unmute, let's look, let's see what you want to talk about. I have a question, and this is kind of generally for if anyone knows, but one of the things I thought of was, are the, like, is improvising at Generations in Jazz and ASJ, I remember speaking to, I think, Ross about it once, and they were saying that that's actually included in the marking. And I wonder if taking that out of the marking would make some more opportunities for students who aren't the top students, who aren't the normal improvisers, to be able to go in and play some solos in those, those bigger environments. Um, I mean, does anyone know if that's part of the marking for ASJ? I don't know. Just the I don't know, but would love to. I love that thought. I hadn't even stopped to consider that. If anyone does know, let me know. It just seems like marking an improvised solo seems so counterintuitive to what we're trying to do with getting more students to improvise and be comfortable in doing it. Especially when the system already has a situation to elevate the great solos. So it's like, if you do a great solo, you get in the super band potentially. There's no need to like, I don't want to say punish a band, but you know, like to, to lose marks over a weaker soloist seems unnecessarily punitive perhaps. And I think that's definitely worth considering um, because it would be great for more students to feel safe having that opportunity to play um, without feeling that there's pressure on them to carry the whole band. I'm really interested to know 
how that plays out. But I have no answer, sorry, Matt. <laughs> We'll petition the organizers, don't worry. Just checking through the chat, there's also um, great to see some other people putting in some research papers and yes, uh, something, Sonia, I can see you've put there about a recent one. That's great because it is, while there are some recent research papers, it has kind of eased off potentially in the, you know, the peer reviewed ones over the last couple of years. So, um, keeping abreast of the research and, and checking that out is awesome as well. So please, yeah, share anything that you've got. Annabella's is really, it's really great. Um, I don't think it's on Nadia's, I don't think there's a link on Nadia's page, but um, it's out there. Um, it was it was done at Temple. I think it's her master's project. It was done at Temple University this year. It's really, really insightful. Some really great stuff in it. That's fantastic. Yeah, Um, all right, what other new messages have we got? Ah, oh, thanks, Jason. Is that, I just saw James posting about that standard of excellence jazz ensemble method. I haven't used it personally. Has anyone tried that one before? It's really good. It's really good. So it's like based on the concert band model, but with all jazz uh, repertoire, it'll go, it's got like three medium swingers, uh, three ballads, three bosses, three shuffly sort of things. And the whole thing is laid out for call and response with, you know, kind of key vocab um, developing for not only taken from the repertoire, like from the, the head of the tune, but also in kind of solo context. So when you have got quite nervous players, um, there's at least something that they've done that can fit the gap. Um, so it's really great for, you know, kind of sing, sing back, play, play back, um, close your books, let's do it again, that kind of thing. Just getting some language and some stylistic understanding. Comes with a uh, CD as well. I'm sure it's a download now. It was a CD when I bought it. Uh, but you can actually download it and um, actually hear the repertoire played and hear the licks so that anybody who is particularly nervous can actually do their homework ahead of next rehearsal. Um, and it was it's super, super valuable. That's awesome. And so user-friendly, so user-friendly. Brilliant and and really good as well. Um, James is, you know, as we mentioned, uh, other directors or things who might be in schools and be kind of thrown into taking a big band or jazz ensemble and and maybe haven't studied jazz themselves at university or anything like that. What a great resource to to give. And I'm pleased to know that it gets the thumbs up from someone who has done those things. Very good. Any other questions, thoughts, topics, anything you want to circle back to in our last couple of minutes? All right. Nothing really. Ooh, yes. No, thank you, Madison. Did we cover not saying boys and girls in band? I probably should have been a, bit, a little bit more specific in that on creating inclusive spaces. Definitely trying to avoid saying boys and girls. Or, yeah, that's or boys avoid. or girls. Yeah, yeah. Or ladies or yeah. There's plenty of great words you can use. Um, folks, people, um, musicians, band. Um, and I'm sure you can come up with some much more fun ones. Uh, I tend to favor party people uh, in my ensembles. Anything that, that is fun but inclusive and doesn't make certain students feel left out is great because it, it's happened to me so many times um, uh, both ways, having bands referred to as ladies or having bands referred to as fellas. And in both cases, it's alienating and problematic um, as an adult and as a student. Um, and it's, it's a really simple thing that we can do that makes little difference to us because we're going to say exactly the same thing whether we start with people or girls or guys um it's not going to change anything about the information we have to 
to, to, to impart, but it will make a massive difference to the way in which that information is received by all students. Yeah, awesome. There's, um, there's a great infographic, should have put it in here, uh, that was posted recently um, with just a bunch of different terms you can, address, you can use to address people that's not guys. Obviously, guys is one that we kind of sit with more comfortably, um, but one that we should probably, you know, many people are starting to question if it's a great term to use in these contexts. So, um, yeah, it's a great little infographic. If anyone wants it, just send me an email and I'll send it through. Uh, Mr. Butler, quick ideas on sourcing and accessing great repertoire from a diverse range of composers. Good question. Um, I know that there's a lot done in the wind ensemble repertoire. Is that is it colourful music, if I'm remembering correctly? I know I've been through a bunch of their stuff. Um, yeah, it's... I haven't seen, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone, I haven't seen really an equivalent for the the jazz and big band repertoire. I think it at this stage it is about trolling through, you know, maybe looking for some of your composers like Strutton with some barbecue, the Will Harden Armstrong tune, what a what a great one to put in there. Um, unfortunately, it, it can be more challenging to find, but it's just about really keeping an eye out, asking people, um, sharing those resources. Again, similarly, um, you know, we could set up a thing in Melbourne with, with great charts. Many of us are friends and colleagues. Let's start a Google Doc and put things in there, you know, just trying to make collaborative spaces to find these things so that we're not all spending 800 years online trying to source one tune that's arranged by a female, uh, you know, arranged by a female or gender diverse person. Absolutely, and Nat made a great point in the chat earlier as well about like budget permitting. If you can commission, you know, uh, a female or gender diverse um, musician to either write or arrange work for your ensemble, like do it. How special to have, you know, something that was written specifically for your band, anyway, um, and especially so if it can then celebrate and uplift. Um, you know, female and gender diverse writers as well. Yeah, just a couple of people that you could ask that from in Melbourne. Um, obviously, Vanessa Perica has been doing amazing things. Um, yeah, Jemima putting in there, great female composers. So Jenna Cave, Minnie Cave. Um, shout out to Ellie Lamb and Cheryl Drum Sickle, who also do, do these types of things. So um, we have people in our own community who can be commissioned to do these work. So if you're you want something just uh, put the feelers out there awesome thank you Jamama. that's really good to know all right just checking through i couldn't see the chat right the way back so if there's anything we haven't covered please feel free to pop it in again um yeah and also use your resources like jemima uh, you know, we're, we're um, hi Rob Beck, see you Rob Beck, um, you know, it, use these good, these great resources that we have in fine music, you know, Brogue Publishing, these local spaces that will have more of this knowledge. All right. Any last thoughts, comments, queries? I think uh, we've thrown enough information at you. Again, um, if you want a copy of the slides or anything that you'd like to share, you know, in, in conversations with colleagues, please do just shoot us an email. And yeah, thanks for being here. Thanks for caring. This is the most important thing is just getting in, thinking about it, having these conversations. So Thank you so much to everyone for, for coming and being a part of this today. We really, really appreciate you being here and, and taking on what we have to share. Darcy and Ellie, thank you so much um, for kicking off our season. What a great, great and interesting presentation. Um, um, I gathered so much. Um, it even got me thinking, I teach in a boys' school, but it got me thinking on how, on how 
the, the vocabulary that I use um, um, in, in, a, in a boys' school situation. So thanks so much. This, uh, the recordings of this will be up on our YouTube channel in a couple of days' time. I edited a few things out, um, trim, it up, trim it up at the front and the start, the, the beginning and the end, um, and then we put them up on the YouTube channel. So you'll be able to go back and uh, review the, um, the session again at your leisure if you wish. So if there are... Um, no further questions. We might we might put a close to this and um, hope to see some of you again at, at some of the other 16 other sessions that we're running between now and the 26th of November. 